Okay, so hello everyone, thank you for joining. So today I'm going to present um, an auction experiment based on work with Andrew Schotter. Um, so in this experiment, we look specifically at auctions, but we believe what, whatever we uncover here might also generalize to other environments. So let me give you Let me give you a quick reminder about the common value auction. So in the common value auction, you have an item that is auctioned off to the bidders, and this item has exactly the same value to all the bidders. What makes the common value auction interesting is that there's some uncertainty about the value of the item. So bidders need to collect some information before they start bidding. So this is a type of auction model that has been used to model um, markets for mineral rights, for timber auctions, and many more markets. So to give you a quick reminder of one standard way of modeling the common value auction. So we assume that we have an object that has a value V. This value V is not precisely known. So instead the bidders know the support of the value V. They might even have some beliefs over the support of the value V, but they don't know it for sure. So they're gonna get some private signal about this value V and this signal is informative about the value V because it's drawn from a range around the true value V with the noise of plus and percent. So that's the case when we have uncertainty over values. Now consider an environment where you have an investment with two possible outcomes. So investment can either succeed, and then if it succeeds, you know exactly what's going to worth, um, be worth, or it can fail, and then in the case it fails, then you also know what it is worth. Then in that type of environment, it seems very natural to form beliefs not about the value, but rather about the success probability. So here they see, Here's an alternative auction format that we propose in the case where the uncertainty is more about the success probability than about the value. In that case, we're going to focus specifically on outcomes with binary, so markets with binary outcomes. So we're going to focus here in this on Benoit distributions, where the main parameter of interest is the success probability. So in that case, you could imagine that the investors do not really know what the success probability is. Also here, they might have some beliefs about the chance, the lowest possible chance and the highest possible chance, um, but they don't know it for sure. So instead, they're gonna gather also some private signal about the success probability P. And this private signal about the success probability P will be informative in the same sense. It's also be around, drawn from a range around the true success probability with a noise of plus minus epsilon. So now some of you might think that this difference between the left side and the right side corresponds to the difference between risk and ambiguity. But let me just tell you two things here. So first of all, in this experiment, we're gonna focus on the compound risk environment. So everything will be with risk. We don't have any ambiguity at all. But also you could imagine to introduce ambiguity on the left side, if you make the distribution F unknown. So here, what we're really interested in is whether investors form beliefs about the value and collect information about the value as opposed to forming belief directly about the success probability and collecting information about the success probability. So it's clear that in the real world, we're gonna have some hybrid situation where we also have some uncertainty about the values and also on top of it, uncertainty um, over the probabilities. But what we conjecture here is that in a, especially in markets with binary outcomes, it feels natural to have uncertainty defined over the probabilities. So let me give you um, some concrete examples. So here, for instance, an example would be an auction on a non-performing loan. So here I'm showing you the screenshot from, of a Chinese platform Taobao. And on this Chinese, plat uh, Chinese platform Taobao, bidders can go on this platform and participate in an auction for the non-performing loan on the real estate. So also here, this non-performing loan has a common value auction factor. So the bidders know the face value of the known. They also know what will happen by default. But before they start bidding to this platform, they're going to collect some information about the defects. Another example would be auctions with work art with dubious problems. Also here, you could imagine that a collector knows the value of the object if it has a good provenance. It also knows that the object would be worth less if it has a bad provenance. So it needs to collect some information about the problem. So here, for instance, I'm showing you some pictures of the website bidder.com, where bidders and collectors go into the auction to discuss some information about the provenance. So here in that specific case, the collectors had a precise uh, assessment of the Chinese 
the value of the chain of space, but they started discussing the signature on chain of space because it was not clear whether or not this chain, um, the space is actually genuine, whether it has uh, bad parts. So the main question that we rise in this paper is whether having the uncertainty defined over a different object, so here probabilities rather than values, matters in action. So to answer this question, we're going to consider the two extreme cases. In one extreme case, we have uncertainty of values, and that's a, the case that we have focused so far in the auction literature. And we're going to continue to call this a common value auction. In the other extreme case, we're going to consider the case where we have uncertainty of probabilities. And to emphasize that this uncertainty is common to all the bidders, we're going to now call it a common probability auction. So our main objective will be to design these two auctions in a strategically equivalent way, such that they only differ in their object of uncertainty. And we are specifically interested in two things. First of all, whether it be the speed differently. And then second, whether the extent of the winner's curves also differ in this type of value. So one reason why the common value auction has been studied so extensively is that it produces this robust phenomenon of bidding. Bidders that tend to be too high because, and um, the fall prey to the winner's curse effect, because they, um, they fail to take into account that winning is also important. If you won, then it's probably because among the set of all bidders, you had the more optimistic signal. So you've probably overestimated the item's value. So ideally, you should shave your bid down. So now many explanations have been suggested for the weak scarce effect, um, level K reasoning, curse of equilibrium, um, the joy of winning, contingent reasoning, but none of these explanations really depend on the uncertainty being defined over the years. So today I'm going to present you with two experiments. In the first experiment, I'm going to show you how such is bid in an auction. There we find that in the common value auction, so in the standard setting, we're basically replicating the standard results of overbidding. But now once we define uncertainty over probabilities in the common probability auction, we see that subjects bid close to the Nash equilibrium. So they bid differently. The second experiment is to meant to shed a little bit more light on why bidders bid differently. And one explanation that you could think is that maybe they bid differently in these two different types of departments because they have different valuations for these two different types of objects. But what we find is that in a non-strategic setting, um, subjects choose exactly the same prices for these two objects. So it seems that the strategic uncertainty matters in this environment, and that's exactly what we have for the Okay, so let me start with the first uh, experiment. So our main goal for this first experiment was to design an auction setting that is as close as possible to the standard setting that we have uh, in the literature. So we consider a market with four bidders. These four bidders will engage in a first part sale bid auction, meaning that the bidder with the highest bid will win the item and then pay its bid. But now the item will be a lottery ticket. So that's the main difference to other experiments of the auction literature. And the lottery ticket is exactly the main feature of experiment design. It's going to be the feature that will allow us to design two auctions that are strategically equivalent and that only differ in the object of uncertainty. So the lottery ticket is a binary lottery that pays the winner either some positive value V or nothing. And the probability of getting this positive value V is defined with this as probability P. So these two parameters are important. So if the bidder knew the success probability P and the value V, then we would have complete information. But now we're going to introduce incomplete information to make it more interesting. And incomplete information will be defined in two different ways. In common value auctions, we're going to define incomplete information by making the value V partially on Whereas in common probability auctions, we'll make the success probability P partially on let me start with the common value auction. So in the common value auctions, for instance, uh, an example of a lottery ticket that we show to the subjects would be the lottery. With a precise probability of 60%, you will get some value V between 30 credits and 90 credits, but you don't know exactly where it is. And otherwise you will get zero. So credits was here are expected. So there's no ambiguity at all. 
the subjects know exactly the underlying statistical process. They know that every integer between 30 and 90 is equally likely to be a real place, but they don't know the value of the percent. So instead, they're going to receive some private signal about this value V. And this private signal about the value V is informative because it's drawn from around the actual value V with the noise of the plasma inside. Then they submit their bids. And at the end, they receive some feedback about the actual lottery ticket, the winning bid, the payoff, the outcome. In the common probability auction, it's going to be exactly the same, but now, Rather than not knowing the value of V, they don't know the success probability. So an example in that case of the probability ticket would be with some probability P between 30% and 90%, you will now get a precise value of 60 credits, and otherwise you'll get it. So also here, there's no ambiguity, no the underlying statistical process. Instead, they're going to receive some signal about the success probability P in that case, also with the noise of plasma excellent. They submit their bids, and at the end, they receive it. So now the main goal was in designing experiments to make these two auctions strategically equivalent. And by strategically equivalent, I mean two things. So first of all, whenever we compare behavior across auctions, the two auctions map exactly on the same scale of bids, and then, um, second, we're going to compare our behavior also to two theoretical benchmarks that is used. In so usually, when we have a common value auction, we compare behavior to the naive bidding curve, so meaning what a bidder would bid if she only takes into account her private information. And the Nash equilibrium bidding curve, meaning the bid of a sophisticated bidder who shaves his bid standard with respect to the naive bidding curve. So here in blue, I'm showing you the naive bidding curve, which is just increasing in the signal. And then in red, I'm showing you the Nash equilibrium bidding curve, which corresponds to a downward shift of the naive bidding curve. So what is important here is now that these blue lines are always the same, regardless of whether the, the auction is a common value auction or a common probability auction. Or in other words, it's always the same, regardless of the signals being values in the middle or about percentage increasing. Okay, so we have different sets of parameters, and now I'm just gonna jump right into the results. And one way to aggregate all this information is to summarize these, uh, the results in terms of the bit factor. The way we define the bit factor here is to say that it's the difference between the subject's bid and the Nash equilibrium. So if the bid factor is equal to zero, just means that the bidder bids at the Nash equilibrium, and if it's positive, then it means that bidder overbids. So this is what we find in the common value auction. So the black dashed line represents where the bid factor should be at the Nash equilibrium. Um, this is distribution of the bid factor, and the red line is the median bid factor. So what we see here in the common value auction is that we're basically replicating the standard finding of overbidding. So having this lottery ticket here did not have an effect. But now, when we compare it to the common probability auction, we see that once we define the uncertainty of the probabilities, subjects now bid at the Nash equilibrium, even slightly in the If you want to see it as a function of the signal, I can show it to you for a specific set of parameters. So here as a dotted line, we have the Nash equilibrium function. The solid line is the estimated median bid in the common value auction, and the dashed line is the estimated median bid in the common value auction. So here we see that subjects highly bid in the common value auction, but they slightly underbid with respect to the Nash equilibrium auction. So now you could think that this really depends on the specific set of factors, meaning the ability response is being high or low, if subjects engage with ability bidding. But if we do this for all the sets of parameters that we consider, we always observe exactly the same. So high overbidding in the value auction and bidding close to Nash equilibrium from the value auction. So subjects bid differently. What about the winner's curse effect? We can look at the winner's curse effect also by focusing now specifically on bids. 
And there we find that in the common value auction, we have a strong fact of the winning scarce effect because almost all the winning bids are above the Nash equilibrium and they even are above, above the break even then. In the common probability auction, there we also have a winner's scarce effect, but it's less severe than Another way to look at this is to look at the distribution of payoffs of the winners. So here I'm showing you the CDF in blue for the common value auction and in red for the probability auction. Then we find that winners lose more money in the common value auction. So we have this difference in bidding behavior. Um, subjects bid differently. The extent of the winner's case is different across these two auction environments. But so far, we don't really understand why they so if you want to understand why, we need to think about the way subjects construct their data. So when I go into the auction, the first thing that I'm going to do is that I will try to find my subjective valuation for the item that is auctioned. Once I have my subjective valuation, then I will have to convert it into strategic bid. So we have these two components that they are. So my non-strategic reflections um, that is, are connected to the fundamental uncertainty and my strategic reflections. The only problem now is that in the common value auctions, these two components are really entangled because in order to find my valuation for the output, I have to infer information from the bits of the odds. So our very first step here would be first to remove the strategic incentives to see whether subjects price these different objects differently. So that's exactly what our second experiment is about. So in the second experiment, we place our subjects in an individual decision-making environment. And then we ask to state their wins to pay for this lobby tickets, ones with certain values, and the other treatment with certain frequencies in a back of the So also here, I'm just gonna jump right into the main results. And I will do exactly the same thing. So I'm gonna aggregate all the um, results from this different set of parameters by showing you now what we call the price factor. So the price factor will be the difference between subjects winners to pay and the expected value of the lottery given the product. And it's just basically the negative of the risk premium. So meaning if the price factor is equal to zero, then it means that the subjects price it at the expected value. And then if it's negative, then it means that they have some kind of positive risk premium. So when we look at the data, this is what we find. So once we remove the strategic incentives, we basically don't see any major differences between these two environments. Subjects tend to price this lot different lottery tickets the same way. And that's really intriguing because before conducting this, uh, the second experiment, every theory and every explanation that we could come up with was either connected to the valuation of these lottery tickets or to the perception of these lottery tickets. So for instance, risk aversion could introduce some differences in bidding behavior because the lotteries have different Or non-expected utility models could also introduce differences in these two environments. If we allow for probability ratings or for ranked utility, for salience functions, or for source dependent models, for instance, if we allow one environment to be perceived as more ambiguous. Also, difficulties of reducing compound lotteries matters in this environment because in both environments we have compound risk. So we analyze uh, this in the second experiment, but at the end, none of them matters in the second experiment. Okay, so let me conclude. Um, so I've shown you today in the first experiment an environment, an auction environment, where defining the uncertainty over probabilities rather than values has an effect. It eliminates overbidding, the standard result of overbidding, and it also alleviates the wind curse. Our second experiment shows us that this difference in bidding behavior does not come from the fact that subjects price this lottery options to perceive and value this lottery options differently. It seems to be really triggered by an interaction between the type of, of the object of uncertainty and strategic uncertainty. So currently, we still have um, a third experiment that is running. Fortunately, I won't be able to so, show you the results of this third experiment. Um, but we are in the middle of investigating where this interaction takes exactly place. Think about strategic uncertainty.
So the main takeaways that I would like you to take from this talk is that really where we define uncertainty matters behavior. So it's different when you have uncertainty of values versus uncertainty of values. There are two things that we need to think a little bit deep. The first thing is that we need to understand how beliefs about probabilities are connected to the strategic approaches. And that's the scenario that I'm currently working on. And the second thing that also arises, the second question is whether this phenomenon that we observe here, this observation that we make here, also extend to other types of contexts, meaning maybe to other markets, or maybe whether this object of uncertainty also interacts with other type of preferences like time preferences or social preferences. So right now, we just got some results from an experiment on temporal resolution of uncertainty. And there we find that even for the preference for resolution of uncertainty, it matters how we define uncertainty, whether it defines values or whether it defines uncertainty. Since I'm uh, in the middle of these two um, areas and two experiments, I would really appreciate any comments that you might have because I quite intrigued. Um, I haven't fully understood it yet. Thank you very much.